Great stories are about decisions. They're about decisions usually that the storyteller makes. Sometimes there are other decisions. But every story has at its heart one particular decision. If you look at your story from the point of not what happened to you, but what was the essential decision that you made, then everything comes out of that. And that decision is why we tell stories, I think. I think we tell stories to let other people in the tribe or the family understand how to deal with really important decisions. And there's something electric about when you're listening to stories, just think about them in terms of a decision. If the story is really electric, it's because somebody has a really difficult decision to make. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. I will live every day as if it were a microphone tucked under my tongue. It's great to get in the game, but don't get in the game until you understand the rules till you're an insider. Your life changes when you begin having a different conversation in your head. What we need to do in radically deep problems is propose radically visionary solutions. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Greetings, everyone. My name is Julie Masters, and you are listening to another episode of Inside Influence, in which I delve into the minds of some of the world's most fascinating influencers or experts in influence to get to the bottom of what it really takes to own your voice and then amplify it to drive an industry, a conversation, a movement, or a nation. Now, here's today's question What makes a powerful storyteller? You know, those who are able to tell a story that whether it's from a porch, a stage, a bar or an auditorium can literally change the fabric of the air around you. Those who can, from their very first breath, plunge us into a world so completely different to our own, yet still offer a roadmap that we can use to solve our own challenges. Those who are able to literally change the way that we view the world. My guest today is not only one such storyteller. His vision and tenacity have both created and inspired over 50,000 stories across the planet. George Dawes Green is an award-winning author. His first novel, The Caveman's Valentine, won the Edgar Award and became a motion picture starring Samuel L. Jackson. His second, The Jura, was an international bestseller in more than 20 languages and became the basis for a movie starring Demi Moore and Alec Baldwin. His most recent, The Kingdoms of Savannah, is currently being made into a major television series. However, for me, George's impact reaches so much further. Back to 1997, when he first founded The Moth from his lounge room in New York. The Moth, as he would describe it, is a raconteur club that he created to recreate the feeling of sultry summer evenings in his native Georgia when moths would be attracted to the light on the porch where he and his family would gather to spin spellbinding tales. The first New York moth event was actually held in George's living room. However, the story events quickly spread to larger and larger venues throughout the city. It has since brought more than 50,000 live stories to audiences across six continents. The Moth Podcast, which contains and curates some of these stories, also won a Webby People's Voice Award for the best podcast series. It is now downloaded more than 100 million times a year, 100 million times a year. If you haven't already discovered The Moth Podcast, please just trust me on this one. In this wide reaching conversation, we explore how the moth began from his own hunger to replicate the intimacy and power of the storytelling of his childhood. What he's discovered about our own collective hunger to share our stories, including the power of the breath and intention of one human being to completely change the fabric of a room. What writing three bestsellers and curating over 50,000 live stories has taught him about how to start and how to end a truly compelling story. Why we are all, and I love this one, why we are all clowns and fools on the bus. And it is that, rather than our triumphs and our wins, that make us powerful storytellers. How to deal with feedback 
especially in a digital age where it kind of comes at you from every angle on every platform, and why he is still the hardest author to Google on the planet. Finally, why the audience is always willing you to succeed and how tapping into that knowledge rather than the myth that they are waiting for us to fail gives you a permission to speak from a place of both truth and clarity. For me, you know, I've got to say that George has been a hero of mine since the very beginning of my career as a fresh faced student in the speaking industry. And over the years, the Moth podcast has given me respite, peace and a sense of connection, the type of connection that can only come from going seven layers deep into the experience of another human being. And my biggest light bulb moment from this conversation was probably one comment that George made about how every powerful story he has ever heard has one common thing at its heart, a decision, a decision to transform, a decision to change, a decision to let go, a decision to hold on. Find the decision in your story and watch your impact go to the next level. Now, for those of you who are ready to take your journey in influence also to the next level, don't forget, as always, hop on my website or the show notes and download the latest version of my ebook, The Influencer Code. It covers the seven areas and also the seven core fundamental questions that I have found hands down to be the most useful at the heart of all decisions when it comes to fast tracking your own level of influence. Just pop in your email address and it will be in your inbox in the time it takes to make a cup of tea. On that note, drive safe, stride out, cycle on, pick up your pen and paper and enjoy one of the most, I promise you, visionary storytellers of our time, George Dawes Green. Welcome to the podcast, George Dawes Green. Such a pleasure to have you here. It's lovely to be with you. Uh, we have we've had so many conversations off air about a multitude of topics, and so I'm very glad to press record now and, and you know start start having these on air. But before I kick into the world of which we both you know love, the world of storytelling, I just want to start by asking. The question I ask at the beginning of every podcast episode, which is, is there one idea right now that's just having a lot of impact on your thinking, having a lot of influence on the way that you perceive the world? Can be new, can be old, could be timeless. I mean, I suppose one one timeless idea that always runs through my life is the sense that um, our great joy comes through community. Um, and we are, we're losing communities. So I guess it's not that the idea is new. It's just become more salient, particularly in the last few years after the pandemic. And and with this burgeoning AI, um, we are losing that idea of physical communities. And everything I've done is about, you know, storytelling and um, creating physical communities. So it just seems to me that it's more important than ever, that we have actual physical places where we gather. Um, I, for example, you know, I mean, I listen to podcasts all the time, and this is a podcast, and, um, you know, The Moth has a big podcast, all of the stuff that I do. Um, it has, you know, there's always electronic connections, and those are great in some ways. They do bring our world closer together. But I think something that is particularly um, moving me and giving me my primal impulse is to get people together in physical spaces, um, listening to stories or listening to all sorts of things that will connect people. Um, I just really love great cafes and great bars and great porches. Um, and I always have, and it feels as though this is where we get the richness of life from these gatherings. And why are we losing them? I mean, I find that uh, astonishing. But I think it's a really, there's something in that. In, I was actually having, it was International Women's Day yesterday, and I was speaking at an event. And um, 
th there was a saxophonist in the background. And at the end of the event, I went over to him and I just said, thank you, you know, it's very hard. I think you're the most underappreciated person in this room. Like the impact of your music on this room has been profound yet, you know, many people wouldn't have kind of looked around to see where it was coming from. And, and he said something really interesting, which is tied to what you said then. He said, you know what? I take a lot of pleasure knowing that the breath that comes out of me and through this saxophone impacts the vibration of this room, the literal vibration of this room and touches every single human being. And he's like, my breath touches every single person in this room. And I walked away from that conversation just thinking that is something that's wholly underestimated when it comes to physical gatherings of human beings, how much we impact each other's energy, vibration, um, sense of belonging, identity. Do you feel like we're getting more or less hungry for that as the digital world kind of continues to grow with speed? Yeah, I think that's a fascinating question. I think it's actually going in two different directions. There are more and more people who seem to, I mean, in some ways they seem to not need it. People who will do all their connecting through TikTok and Instagram. Um, but then it also seems as though there's this profound hunger for real physical gatherings and real physical connections. And it's, and hunger is the right word. I mean, it's a, um, the, you know, the, wherever the moth goes, we, we sell out, you know, right. We'll sell out. We'll, we'll go to Pittsburgh and sell, you know, a 5,000 seat auditorium. Um, we can go kind of anywhere in the world and say, oh, we're going to have an evening where you'll listen to stories and people want to they'll pour into these events. And those folks feel that sort of the power of, that you have to be there uh, and and that the storyteller is going to feed off the audience and the audience is going to feed off the storyteller and this thing is going to happen. But there, you know, so it's really interesting how the world is dividing into these two groups, the people who are saying we have to have these real physical connections. Uh, we have to get away from being ruled by the iPhone and buy these little boxes, these little rectangular boxes. Um, and then there are lots of people who are just giving in, you know, they're saying, well, that's where the world is, is taking us. They seem to be fine with it. Have you, have you felt as somebody that is so deeply entrenched in the, in the world of story? Have you felt the shape of our hunger change? You know, from, I know that I have certainly noticed that, you know, this kind of shift between short form stories, you know, you've got Ted is, an ex is one example, TikTok is another example, very different, but short form. And then the longer form story. And I was talking to an, an ad exec recently, and he was saying that there's been this massive shift in advertising between the, the ads that are the story form ads that are working really well, the really, really short one, or the most successful one he's ever seen was four hours long. Have you noticed the shape of a hunger change? Wait, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just so curious. What uh, he he did a four hour long. <laughs> four, four hours. <laughs> what was it that he was doing? Four hours. Oh, was, um, ben Jones from from Google. They study the. It's like five billion hours of video that gets uploaded to YouTube every day, and they study um, what people pay attention to, what they don't pay attention to. And he was saying that it was an ad for, um, I think it was Hyundai, an ad for Hyundai, and it was four hours long, this ad. And it was one of the most successful ads they had ever run. And it was just a video of somebody driving and different things popping up in the background, in the landscape as the car drove past. And people would just have it on in the background while they were working. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, uh, and. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely true. That sounds like something that I, I mean, I would tune into that. It is amazing how our, you know, we think that TikTok is training folks to have a 12 second attention span. And maybe, you know, some part of our brain is responding to that. But then you have, 
millions of people who are happy to go to Avatar and see something that's, I don't know, three hours. Or, I mean, honestly, you know, it's true. We, you know, uh, when people are at the moth, they don't get bored. Uh, the story, you know, sometimes the evenings will go on for two and a half hours. I find, yeah, the it, you know, it really is interesting how, depending on where you are or what you're doing, you adjust your uh, expectations um, and your attention adjusts. And so people, um, yeah, I don't know that our attention spans really have changed as much as we think they have. They certainly, people's attention spans when you're online gets shorter and shorter. But then I think people are perfectly happy, to, you know, to go and spend four or six hours watching uh, an opera or, you know, um, spend all day watching um, a series of Shakespearean plays, um, you know, about the about the Tudor kings. I mean, it's just, um, that's, that's really interesting. Where did your, I'm curious to know, where did your love of stories and storytelling begin? Was there a, a particular time in your life where that light really went on for you? It went on in different times of my life. I, I do, when I was a kid, uh, I would sneak out of my room late at night um, and sneak downstairs and turn on the TV to watch. I always wanted to watch uh, talk shows. In those days, it was like the Tonight Show with Jack Parr. I mean, it was a long, long time ago. But honestly, the thing, and I can remember very distinctly, certain storytellers that I would listen to that would come on those shows. You know, mostly it was just um, actresses and, um, you know, very, very light stuff. But every now and then, on would come a, a truly great raconteur. At the same time, I was growing up, um, spending a lot of time down south, uh, say, driving up to Savannah, Georgia, with my mom, and sitting with the with all of the aunts and and cousins in Savannah, Georgia, in a a, a huge Victorian house with a big, very very hot parlor. And my mother's name was Inez. She was named for her grandmother, so she was called Little Inez, and her grandmother was called Big Inez. And Big Inez was gone, but now there were there was my mother, Inez, and then several cousins also named Inez. And I would sit there with the Inezes, and they would tell stories, you know, real old Southern-style stories um, that were beautiful and moving um, and often very strange and, and you know, with a, with a dark streak running through them. But I think that and... Um, and my dad used to tell stories, and I really grew up just uh, really from earliest childhood remembering that s listening to stories was my favorite thing. But it wasn't until I was, you know, an adult. I'd been living in New York for years. Um, I began to think that we could have a whole evening See, what was happening was that every time I would, at a party, if you'd try to launch into a story or listen to someone's story, interruption vultures would descend. And I just found that very annoying. And I began to think about the idea of having an evening of just stories where people couldn't be interrupted. And so I finally got around to having one and it in 25 years ago 1997 it was an amazing um, it was an amazing experience I mean it wasn't very the stories weren't very good actually it wasn't like we wa walked away with a sense oh this is triumphant but I did leave uh, having put on this one evening in my apartment I thought I think this will work I think we have to put a lot of work into it I think we have to direct stories and I think we need a violinist that will make sure that people wind up 
in 10 minutes because otherwise people will think that they're going to go in for 10 minutes and they'll go on and on and on. And so the idea of having a timekeeper um, was very, very comfortable for our audiences. I mean, I don't know. The audiences at any rate loved it from the very beginning. What is that? You know, the, the idea of, of constriction being the mother of of kind of creativity, you know, the, the boundaries. To, why is it so important that it's a set time? What does that do? Well, I guess, I mean, in a very practical sense, it gives people the sense if, if the story is a, a little bit tedious or if people are thinking, well, where is this going? Just to know that we've got them and that this thing is going to wind up in 10 minutes. Um, it's a big help for the audience. There are very few people, after all, who can really carry off a single story for a long time. There are some who are amazing. Um, um, Edgar Oliver is, well, really, I, I consider him one of the, I mean, probably the greatest living raconteur. Some people who listen to the moth a lot will know that he speaks in this, very deep, strange voice. But he tells stories about his um, psychotic mother in Savannah. Um, they're just amazing. Look up Edgar Oliver and listen to his stories. But the thing about Edgar is that he could actually go on as long as he wants. If he wants to go on for three hours, the audience won't budge. There are very few people who can carry that off. I think we want the assurance, the reason we want a timekeeper is that assurance that we will come to the end of this and then we'll have another story. And what did you, very early on when you first started, I think it's 1997, you started it in your lounge room. Um, what was it that made you think this has, this has something? Like, as you said, you came away going, could have been better, we could do this better, the story should be shorter, we need a violinist. Um, but there was obviously something, right? Like, what did you feel? There was some kind of magic. I w I'll take you back actually a little bit earlier to the first time that I really conceived oh, of this. I, I was at a poetry slam, and this was back in the late 80s in New York, and poetry slams were the big thing in New York. I used to go kind of religiously, although mostly, I mean, sometimes they were, you know, incredible. Um, but every now and then we would get these poets in the eight in the in the nineteen eighties, it was very popular to have these kind of surrealistic poems, sort of strings of non sequiturs, delivered in that particular poetic voice that always would go up to a question mark, and so there was a a woman who was giving this or her poem, and it was my father's six-pack at the top of the unbridled stairs of my impossible childhood of strange abuse and the pain of oxygen, and on and on. And then, this, and then the poem ended and she got polite applause. And then, she before she began the next poem, she said, so I just, my next poem is about my grandfather. I used to go, to go fishing with my grandfather. He'd come in the morning, like really early, like 4 a.m. He'd come to pick me up in, in the Bronx. I was living in the Bronx. And I'd get into this station wagon with this, you know, this kind of wood-paneled station wagon, and we'd drive up into the country to this little trout stream and then you know we just put our poles out and brown trout in the morning just as the sun was coming and what had happened I, I looked around and saw that the audience was riveted because she had dropped that there was this veil that she put up with her palms of I am an artist and and you are the audience and then when she's just telling a story that went away and it was there was something really magical about looking around the room and seeing everybody was, was utterly connected 
by the simplicity of a personal story. And I, I went to the host of the night, my dear friend Bob Holman, um, and said, hey, Bob, what about the idea of having a night where we have the stories that poets use to introduce their poems without the poems? And <laughs> he thought I was just taking the piss. Poetry and I won. without the poems. <laughs> without poems. And so he just, but that was the idea that really where that started to grow in my head and I, that eventually turned into creating the moth. You just got me thinking there about the, one of the things that I noticed with storytellers, so raconteurs, storytellers, and I'm really interested in, what, in why you're very specific with the word raconteurs. I would love to ask you more about that. Um, but the difference between scripted and, you know, kind of off the cuff in the moment. And, you know, what you just described there is, you know, poetry that's heavily scripted, even the pauses are well thought out. And the idea of just telling a story of, you know, this is how it felt, this is where I was. What guidance do you give? Because I know the moth is now, you know, is now a beast unto itself and people that you go on to the moth, they get very specific guidance about storytelling. What guidance do you give them as to how far to script this and how far just to let it flow? Well, that's interesting because I, th one of the things that has been in the DNA of the moth from the very beginning was that we wouldn't try to control too much what the directors are and the curators are telling the storytellers. That is, we allow a, you know, a, a great breadth. Um, but one thing that does sort of essentially come through is that uh, I mean, for example, some some directors uh, have no problem with the storytellers writing out a story. Um, but then what you have to do is you have to go through a process as you're rehearsing it where you kind of forget what you've written. Um, it is good to do that sort of preparation, but you really do need to seem, when, when you're up on stage, it needs to feel like it's come, like it's being freshly baked. Um, that it's not coming from a script. That's really important and powerful. It also, it has to be a personal story. You know, from in the very beginning, we had a few people who would just come up and tell stories that their grandfathers had told them, and that really never worked. You really need, the audience really needs to feel this is your story, and you are thinking about it and just telling it, and telling it in the most simple way. And that there's not, you, you don't use fancy language. Um, it's just simply that idea of imparting a story. But I, to be very clear, it is to me an art. And I don't ever think it's just, um, um, you know, I don't think it's just somebody telling a story as a, it's not a craft, it's a real art, which means that we can constantly experiment with the form. Um, and you'll find the great raconteurs, they all have completely different styles. You know, some of them, Jonathan Ames is one who comes out and just, just it's just a rat-a-tat-tat -tat of his thoughts that are bouncing in his brain. Um, and it's a beautiful thing to watch. Edgar Oliver is very, very slow and measured. And um, and so, I mean, there are all these, all these different styles. But I love that idea of starting with, starting with a map, you know, there's a map of the terrain that you're trying to introduce somebody to and, and the best way through that terrain. And then once you've got a map in your idea, then letting it go almost. And going, I know I need to get from point A to point B. I know that there are three or four points in between that that I kind of need to hit. Um, but I'm going to allow myself the freedom to move between those in a way that feels right in the moment, wherever the energy is taking me, wherever my words are taking me. What's um, What's been your your favorite story? And this is probably an impossible one for you to answer, but I'm going <laughs> to ask it. I mean, uh, I... I have to go back to Edgar Oliver. I, um, 
Edgar Oliver told a story called The Apron Strings of Savannah. Um, I find that to be a particularly gorgeous story. Um, I have so many favorites, as you, you know, I can't. Um, the ones, I mean, so many are popping into my head right now. Sherry Holman told a story um, about when her child, her son, I was two years old. He had cancer of the eye, and um, he, he's fine now. Um, he's grown up to be, um, you know, very healthy. But obviously, that was a terrifying passage for her, and she, and and she she fell into this strange spiritualist mode of approaching her life. Um, the story is called "Eat the Eat the Day." Um, and it just, there's just, again, the story is very natural. Um, it's very vulnerable. She was revealing things about herself that are painful to reveal. And those are the stories that are almost always the most powerful. Um, people who are very, very honest win us over, um, and then the other thing that I always think is the most important part of a, a great story is that great stories are about decisions. They're about decisions usually that the storyteller makes. Sometimes there are other decisions. But every story has at its heart one particular decision. Actually, it's also true of every great novel. Um, if you understand, if you if you look at your story from the point of not what happened to you, but what was the essential decision that you made, then everything comes out of that. I'll give you an example. I, I, I used to, I often, people will sort of present stories to me. They'll, um, you know, they'll, I'll be at a bar and somebody says, I've got this great story. But one thing that a lot of people do is they'll come up and say, oh, I've got a great story. And then they'll tell me about an accident that they were in, just this terrible accident. And then those accident stories, uh, they can be, you know, horrific stories, but they're just not very interesting, usually. One time somebody was telling me this story about, you know, he got into a skid, he was driving through the winter, and um, he started skidding madly to the left and then madly to the right, and I didn't care very much. And then he said, and then the car went over through the guardrail into a creek, and I, it just sank. And he said, and this was, um, it was this old car, so it had one of those crank up windows, and the window was completely closed. So he said, I'm, I'm okay. I was at the bottom of a creek. I, I was okay. I had this, uh, I had air down there, but I knew if I wanted to try to get out, I was going to have to uncrank the window, so that I could open the door. But if I uncranked the window and the water started coming in, I was going to freeze and maybe drown. But I didn't want to just sit there and wait f to run out of air. And as soon as he started telling that, the story became about a decision that he had to make. And that decision is why we tell stories, I think. I think we tell stories to let other people in the tribe or the family understand how to deal with really important decisions. And there's something electric about, you know, when, when you're listening to stories, just think about them in terms of a decision. If the story is really electric, it's because somebody has a, a really difficult decision to make. I've never, I have never heard it framed like that before, that the, the most compelling stories are about a decision, but I'm just running through my mind and it's 100%. A hundred percent true. And what makes that compelling is that it gives us a framework for our own decision making. I want you to talk to me about the beginnings of a compelling story here, you know, as a writer, as a storyteller. You know, if I would listen to that story that you just told me, you know, I can imagine that on stage. I can imagine, you know, starting with, you know, I was I was sat in my car at the bottom of a creek. How how have you learned to begin? Because beginnings are obviously exceptionally important when it comes to any form of story, any form of 
presentation, novel. How do you think about beginning? What are some of the core questions you ask yourself about how am I going to begin this? Well, I, you know, it's interesting. I've tried, I have approached it many different ways. Um, there are, obviously it's usually effective to start a story um, right, you know, in, in medias res, as we say, right, right in the middle of the action and then kind of go back. But I don't, I don't do that anymore. Um, I do it sometimes with a novel. You know, my latest novel, The Kingdoms of Savannah, starts the very first sentence is sort of laying out some of the horrors that we're f about to face. But that's because that's a thriller. Often in stories, I'll start somewhere else um, in, entirely, something that really sets the stage. And then there's one particular way that I always like one thing that I like to do when I start a story, I like, um, we call it buried treasure. If, if there's some kind of a talisman, for example, you might have a story about your grandmother, and the story might start where your grandmother is giving you a, a locket. And then, and then you move on. The locket is just mentioned. But then at the very end of the story, you come back to the locket. Now, by then, the audience has totally forgotten the locket, but they haven't totally forgotten the locket. They just put the locket way back in the back of their brains, and suddenly the locket is brought forward again, and now it has so much more meaning. That idea of buried treasure is, you know, that's, that's, that's a really powerful tool. So we like to make sure that in your first paragraph, as you, you know, however you're going to lay out the story, make sure there's something that you can go, that you can go back to at the very end that will pull everything together. In the speaking world, we call that um, open and closed loops to you, know, you open a loop at the beginning, you close it at the end, kind of. Is the power of that because it gives a sense of completion? Is that, you know... Is that the power from a listener's standpoint to having an open loop, a closed loop, it's hidden treasures? Yeah, I mean, it shouldn't. I honestly don't think it should feel like a closed loop. I think it should feel as though something that was very vague and blurry has become very clarified now, and you can see it, you know, with all of its glistening emotional facets that you can, that you have been introduced to a world that you understand so well now that you now can go back to look at the objects that you were presented with in the beginning, and they all have meaning. Um, I think, so I, I think you're looking to create a world. I, I don't think you should make it feel like this is the closed world. Uh, and I, I, I have to say I have a private pet peeve. I hate when people say at the end of a story, and then I realized. In fact, I, I make it a really important rule, and it's a rule, I think, with most of the Moths directors, that um, if that word realized comes in, um, we'll get rid of it. Because the point is that a lot of people think, well, the story is, so I'm, I'm learning a lesson, and I just want to impart the lesson, which I guess is somewhat true, but what you don't want... Is, what you want is for the audience to get the lesson without you having to say it. The audience should understand what you realize because the audience has realized it. And so if you try to sum everything up and put it into a little moral or a little, you know, this little last paragraph that ties things too neatly, I find that I am very resistant to that. I really like the story to end at some moment of of emotion and color and, and reality. You want to be in the story at that last moment. And actually the moment should come as a bit of a surprise. I, I, I hate to give away Edgar Oliver, but what, he's telling a story about, about his mother and lots and lots of things have happened and we've really come to a, a great understanding about his relationship 
to his mother. But the last paragraph of the story is the, the last moments that he saw his mother when he lived in Savannah. Um, and, and she was walking away from him. And then he describes in exquisite detail her, the clothing that she was wearing. And she said, and he says, and, and I'm going to try to do his voice a little bit. She said, he says, and she looked a little like a clown walking away. And the beauty of it is that we don't expect the story is going to end there. It just, he just stops. And then there are waves of you understanding what it was that the whole story is about. So that's, that's the technique of a great raconteur. It's to be able to not tell you a realization, let you come to the realization, and to leave you in the story until the very last line. There's a, there's a quote that I, that I have from you here that I wanted to ask you about, and it ties kind of really beautifully with what you just said. Uh, great storytellers really never tell about triumphs. They always focus on weakness and loss and their own humanity, their own clownishness. And it's so interesting that you just used the word clown. And um, why? Why is that? Because I think a lot of people approach storytelling of, you know, the hero's journey, right? You know, there I was and, and, and there I went and these terrible things happened and here I am now. You know, I emerged. Talk to me about balancing that desire to only talk from a place of, and I emerged triumphant, from, to telling uh, about our weakness, about loss, humanity, and our own clownishness. Yeah, great question. Um, uh, and a question that a storyteller would ask. Um, I... You know, it's so interesting because people, when they do think about the shape of stories, they often go back to that Joseph Cam Campbell uh, idea of the hero's journey. Those are stories, though, that are usually third-person stories, the stories that, you know, that Homer told or the stories that, you know, you get from um, classical literature. It often has a slightly um, uh, religious tone to it. The idea of the hero's journey, um, it, it, I mean, it, you know, it's, I, I just think that sometime around the birth of the English drama, so we're looking at the late 1500s, it's the same time in Italy that um, they were developing the aria, that is the idea of a single, of a single uh, voice expressing um, a great, deep emotional truth about themselves. The this uh, so at the same time that the aria was being developed, the soliloquy was being developed, and there was a revolution, I think, in art then that continues to carry through to today. Is that storytelling becomes all, uh, and art in general becomes more and more personal less of that sense of we have we have to impart the religious beliefs of our tribe and more we have to impart what it's like for an individual to go through this bizarre existence and 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 this often incredibly painful existence and that i mean you you know, in the, in the time of Shakespeare, that just that revolution, um, which was so compelling to theater audiences, and I think is still with us. You know, we we become I hate to use the word confessional, but we do become more and more personal. Uh, and I think that there's a great power to those raconteurs who can simply say, "I am a fool." I am just like you. I'm a, I'm a total. Um, I don't. Uh, I, I won't use the word. Um, but <laughs> I just 
Or I guess I can use any word I want. I mean, I don't know. Use any word you okay, want. Okay, well, I will. Yeah, you'll cut it if you don't like it. No, I mean, if you can say I'm a total fuck up. And, and, and that sort of honesty that, by the way, you get from the great comedians. Um, so, I mean, I just saw Chris Rock um, just talking about what a total fuck up he is. That, that's what an audience wants to hear. Um, so you, you really want to express your vulnerability. I, I remember very clearly a, a night when we were having, it was a night about wine, and a, a great American writer came and wanted to tell how he had gone to a wine tasting and he'd learned enough about wine that he was able to triumph at this wine tasting, even though he was just this American neophyte at wines. And we listened to the story politely, and then the next person came up and told the story of how she sat next to Princess Anne and got drunk to the point when you she was only supposed to be tasting the wine, she just drank them all and made a total fool of herself. And it, the story was, um, the, the combination of seeing these two stories together was to me illuminating. It was the, the audience was in raptures because the audience felt like, okay, that's, that's what we really want to hear about. We really want to hear about how, how you fuck up and yet, and yet you survive. And also the, the layers to human experience. Um, I was just thinking, I was at a storytelling event, one here in Australia, not so, probably actually about two, three years ago now. Um, I was heavily pregnant and I had been asked to do it and the theme was what I desire the most what, or what I truly desire. And I sat down, I wrote, it was 10 minutes. And the way that this storytelling, that's called Generation Women, it's a beautiful event. And there's a story from a 20 year old, someone in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, so women from every decade tell a story on this particular theme. And I was team 40s. And team 20s got up. I mean, you can imagine, right, what I truly desire. You can imagine. Um, Team 20s got up and it was basically X-rated. Team team 30s got up and it was, you know, something fabulous and, and you know, spontaneous. And then I was just sat there. And I remember I was sat there with team the lady who was representing Team 70s and she was um, an Order of Australia winner. Like she was incredible um, pioneer in the charitable space. And I'm sat next to this older lady listening to the – as it was that the sexual exploits of, of team twenties and thirties. And I knew that I had to get up and I had written this piece around my journey with IVF and my journey with infertility and what it feels to like to desire something that feels like it doesn't desire you for whatever reason. And I remember just sitting there thinking, what have I done? Like, what have I done? These, these women are telling such frivolous, funny stories and I'm going to have to get up here and to talk about something that's very personal to me, very vulnerable to me, very emotive to me. And it got me thinking about the difference between talking from scars and wounds. You know, to tell a story from a wound when you're still so in it and it's still like way too close to you. As it was at that time, I was pregnant with my second child and, you know, we were kind of, I could speak to it from a scar rather than a wound. But how do we go about telling difficult stories, especially when they're difficult stories that um, maybe break the rules as to traditionally the stories that get told or want to be heard? How do we approach those in a way that holds a room safe? Because that's our job, right, as storytellers, to hold the room safely. Well, I, that's an interesting question. I mean, I wouldn't, I don't think that we're trying to hold the room safe, Um but I, I think that we're I, some. I mean, great things are often dangerous. Um, it, you ha obviously with the moth, we're very, very conscious of this because, you know, we we go to the schools a lot and get high school students and college students to tell stories, and telling difficult stories is, you know, is is learning the art, you know, in order, you can't master the art unless you tell the difficult story. But then you just have to be careful um, 
that because it you know when people are telling these stories about tragic losses the loss when when they're on stage you know it's interesting you can go through like eight rehearsals and you can get through them all and then you're on stage and then you're telling the audience and whatever that again whatever that human connection is in that room means that you are living it and so people will break down i think that they're almost always feel healthier afterwards there's a sense that having shared this is really important but gosh it can it can feel dangerous at the time i do think it's, it's so interesting that um young people are m- much more willing to share than older people and i had an experience nice. i don't i i i find that i don't i don't know i mean it could honestly be um maybe partly it has to do with the moth um and it wasn't just the moth but the moth and a lot of other things that were coming along that were saying you have to share this stuff and you know so uh, uh, every now and then I'll I'll go teach students I was at um Beloit University um uh recently and uh as you know it was a fellowship I was teaching a senior class and I asked the students to tell 3 minute stories and the stories that they told the first 3 minute stories were always stories about oh I got so drunk the other night and then, you know they were funny and um stupid and then I said well let's go back and and I gave them another assignment and I said this time try to be more try to take a little risk think about vulnerability and being able to really share something. And I guess that was a cue because back came um stories particularly from women, young women that were telling they they told stories about abuse that they had suffered. Um they were it was terrifying for me to hear these stories because I felt like oh I'm wading in waters that I don't know I mean I'm not really equipped and then I was talking to one of the students who had revealed so much about herself and she said no um it they she said George it's I've already told this in in a poem and then I've already written it and uh you know it's published in the literary magazine and actually I I just feel that we we are so much more open about this now. I don't you shouldn't feel so scared for us. And I I wondered. I thought, well, maybe that's true because they were just much more open about about those abuses than I know my generation would have been. We would never have told those stories. No, and there's a gift in that. I think for for newer generations for for younger generations there's a there's a gift and i you know i i credit the digital world to it as well you know that there's a gift in living in a way that is more cr- as a cross section of humanity you know here are my experiences overlaid with your experiences overlaid with you know there's there's a gift that there's definite boundary issues with that and it brings with it another generation of challenges um new to them unto them but there's a a beautiful a beautiful gift in that i want to talk about feedback now because you know when you put a story out there into the world i mean you're you know your your writing and your novels have had extraordinary success you know to hollywood films um there's always going to be feedback right there's always going to be critics there's always going to be someone when you step off stage who comes up to you and says oh, that was amazing but if I, <laughs> if i were you there's there's always that moment how have you you know you're so prolific how how have you come to a um embrace that feedback do you do you set a boundary up and go actually you know in this moment thank you very much but 
I'm not open to, to feedback at the moment. How do, how do you take it in and what have you learned to do with it? Well, there are so many different kinds of feedback that I get. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess I'm, uh, I try my best to stay open to it. Um, I think it's important. I, I don't, I mean, <clears throat> honestly, if you go on Goodreads, <clears throat> if you're an author today, you get a lot of feedback that you didn't used to get 10 or 15 years ago. I mean, you're getting, honestly, thousands of comments. You know, I don't read a lot of them. I don't want to get, I mean, I, well, what can I say? Uh, uh, my wife reads them and then um, sometimes asks me to read them. Sometimes they're really good points. Sometimes they seek completely silly. Um, but uh, honestly, no, I think it's a, I think it's an incredibly valuable tool. I do, you know, I do read them. Um, and a lot of them are, you know, for my latest novel, uh, I get just deep, tremendously uh, wonderful comments that I really, really treasure. Um, every now and then a comment that seems, you know, first of all, they're... they're Anything that's open in the United States will have, there will be racist comments. People will say, oh, this is race baiting if you talk about um, the slavery history of Savannah. So that's tough. But honestly, uh, I think you try to keep as open as you can. Because otherwise, you know, what are you in it for? You, know, you have to get, you have to feel that response from the audience. And how do you know? How do you know when a story is complete for you in yourself? I never do. Do you reach a moment? Yep. You never do. I'm really curious about that. Does it never. a moment where you go, "No, this is done"? No, never. Do you? Do you have a sense where you? I wow, no one's ever asked me that before. <laughs> I have a sense. I have a sense of when it is done as it can be in that moment. And that if I come back to it again and did it again, I'm sure that there could be more. But then what I do, unfortunately for me, and it's a habit I'm trying to break, is I take it to a place where I think, okay, this is as done as it can be in this particular iteration, this particular moment. And then I'll mess with it for another, you know, few hours, days, when I know full well that I'm just, you know, arranging chairs on the deck uh -huh. of a giant ship now and it makes no sense <laughs> at all. I haven't been able to break that habit. Um, but no, there's never this moment of, you know, this beautiful, cathartic moment as a storyteller or a writer where you just go, da -da, you know, ba -ba -ba -ba. this is done. Yeah, my moment comes because my, my editor says, if, it's, if you don't hand it in by noon, I will simply use the draft that I have. And... You know, she waits a long time to say she went to the very last moment. She once told me, she said, okay, you can keep it over the weekend. It'll cost $4,000 because that was simply the additional price that the printer was going to ask for a rush order. And so I said, oh, great. I mean, I was willing to spend $4,000 to get three more days to work on this. So I'm... Um, I try to listen to her and try to get it in on time. That's about it for me. I don't ever have a sense that I'm done. I always want to play with it. And, you know, because my books tend to be made into movies or right now they're trying to make a TV show out of um, Kingdoms of Savannah. And so I'm working on the TV show and then there's just all the characters are very much alive. You know, and they're still they'll uh, I, st I still have new things to put them through, new ideas. So, no, I never have a sense that I'm done with a story or a, a novel. I haven't had that yet. Sense of completeness. My final question, if, if there's anybody out there who tomorrow or today or next week or next month knows they have to get up and put into practice the art of the raconteur, the art of, of the storyteller, what's the one thing, if they forget everything that we've talked about, and we've talked about so many things in this conversation, what's... What's the one thing that they just take one thing and apply it? What would that one thing be? Well, I guess we what we've been talking about is a lot of preparation. 
So we've been talking about how do, how do you prepare the story? Look at the decision and be vulnerable and be honest. And But then there's the moment when you're actually up on stage, which is just terrifying. It's just... I. Um, it honestly is the scariest thing that a lot of people do because you don't, well, like if you're telling a story for the moth, you don't have a script. So you're worried, oh, you know, what if I forget? What if I, you know? Um, and then you go up there and and then you start and you're generally, you're a little terrified in the beginning. And the, then somehow the audience lets you know that they love you. They almost invariably do if you're just telling an honest story. And what almost all storytellers go through is there's kind of a surge and then you feel completely comfortable and you just float along. And I would tell storytellers, just don't, I, it's hard because I go through the same thing every time I'm going to tell a story. I go through that same terror. I would tell them that um, y you're going to be fine. People um, people are going to love you and they're going to love and they'll love your vulnerability. And if you should falter, if you forget something, or if you just suddenly freeze up and you say, I just you can't talk for a moment. Um, the audience will applaud and they'll completely connect with you. And then you can restart. And it's often happened to storytellers that they, they falter and then something about that love and that connection just makes you feel, oh, I'm fine. And then you are fine. And, and, and you'll finish your story and you'll be, um, you'll, you'll, then you'll be really, really floating. Like it's a great bliss compared to the horror of just before you get up there. <laughs> and I think that that's, something to to really underline that we can go into these situations believing that everybody in front of us is a critic or, or a wannabe critic or watching us and waiting for us to get something wrong or pulling it to pieces in actual fact you know the the audience wants you to succeed and especially if you look nervous especially if you look like it took every ounce of guts that you have to get on that stage or to stand up in front of people you look around and every single human being there is willing you to succeed. Yeah. And 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 space for you to do that. Yeah. Because they're all they're all fools and clowns too. We're all fools and clowns. <laughs> We're all fools and clowns. Amen to that. Oh well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Um thank you so much for the moth. As I said before we came on air, you know, it's made an incredible difference to my life to be able to drop into the human experience so completely and succinctly um, and without filter whenever I want to. You know, there's there's been a beauty in that in my own world that wouldn't have been there without you. So thank you. Julie, this has been a real pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and have seized hold of at least one tool, idea or mindset that will help you start raising your own level of influence. Now, for those of you who want to take the next step in your journey or would just love a roadmap to becoming the most influential voice, idea or brand in your space, then I have good news. You can now download the latest updated version of my ebook, The Influencer Code, from my website, juliemasters.com. Also, there's a link in the show notes. Just pop in your email address, and I promise I will not spam you, but it is jam-packed full of ideas, tools, and case studies that I have come across in my now 20-plus years of doing this work, not to mention the seven areas and seven core questions that I have found to be hands down the most valuable when it comes to immediately lifting your ability to make an impact. Download it, keep it, share it, juice it for all it is worth. I hope it makes a massive difference in both your career and your business. Thank you always to my co-founder and the main brain behind this podcast, Lauren Kelly. You kick my butt in all the right ways. Thank you for making it happen. 
And if you did enjoy the show, then we would love you to share this podcast and leave us a review on iTunes, Google, Stitcher, whatever your platform of choice happens to be. And don't forget to subscribe to make sure that you never miss an episode.